All right, welcome everybody to the first of our uh, New Paradigm of Business video interviews. I'm very happy to be joined today by Rich Toffel. Just a little bit of quick setup here. Um, below the video here, you should see a chat window, and you can start chatting in that window anytime. You don't, don't need to wait until the interview is over. We'll show you the interview. I'll apologize in advance that there are a few technical glitches uh, in the video feed. Nothing you can do about that. That's on our end, not on yours, so you don't need to worry about it. Take about 46 minutes for the interview, and after that we'll have a live Q&A session that'll last about 15 minutes where you can ask Rich questions using that little chat window right underneath the video. And uh, if it's if there's more questions than that, we'll, we'll go longer if, if we need to. Great, so enjoy the interview, and uh, I'll talk to, you, uh, t talk to you guys live in a few minutes here. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Rich Toffel. Rich is a very powerful and successful change agent, also a client of mine and a buddy and a co-conspirator in changing the world. Um, Rich has done a lot in his life. He's worked on AIDS relief in Africa. He's worked with the USAID on programs in Brazil, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, he's currently Chief Strategy Officer of the Workplace Wellness Council of Mexico. Um, and uh, also working uh, to transform government, and we'll have a chance to get into that a little bit later. Uh, you write for the Stan Stanford uh, Social Innovation Review. I've seen some of your lovely articles and blog posts there. Uh, he's a guest lecturer at Johns Hopkins University. He's on the core team of Amadeo Mundi, the boards of Compass Partners and Wayfarers Chapel, uh, the advisory boards of Ruckus and the Presidential Youth Commission. Uh, he's an ordained minister, both, uh, if I remember right, you're both a Baptist minister and a Swedenborgian minister, is that right? Swedenborgian. Um, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Okay. And, and he's, uh, he was assistant minister at the Harvard University Chapel. Uh, and one of your most successful change agency uh, activities is coming to fruition currently. So Rich was uh, one of the founder of the Log Cabin Republicans, who was an early leader on the gay marriage issue. And Rich, I saw a uh, video of you debating with, uh, what was the gentleman's name, that presidential candidate? Uh, Gary Bauer. Gary Bauer uh, being interviewed by Jim Lehrer with the two of you debating scripture about gay marriage. And I remember you predicting at the time that uh, he and a lot of other people were going to be on the wrong side of history, and uh, that seems to have borne fruit. <laughs> so uh, congratulations on that as well. Um, and then most relevant to our talk today, uh, you recently ran a uh, contest in the state of Michigan, a statewide contest for social entrepreneurs to educate them about how to be successful social entrepreneurs and how to get funding and how to make their efforts really play out in, in both in a socially measured success and also a financially measured success. Um, and, and you have plans to do that elsewhere as well, is that right? That's right. Other states are also interested in doing it, so we speak to a number of other states. Good. Well, so, so as you know, we have an audience of people here who are uh, folks interested in the new paradigm of business. And in particular, we've got a, a pretty large group of uh, solopreneurs and social entrepreneurs who are working with small businesses and seeking to grow them. And also, we have leaders, uh, sitting leaders of larger business who is, businesses who would be interested in having their organizations operate in more of a new paradigm way. So I just want you to bear in mind we got more than one kind of listener here. So um, so what would you say uh, about this uh, this effort in Michigan, this contest that you ran recently? What did you do there? How did that work, and what did you learn from it? Well, I think big picture, Tim, uh, the reason I'm so interested in uh, social innovation and social enterprise is because uh, capitalism, most powerful force for good in many ways in the world. Um, we see what it's doing to China and India and transforming uh, poverty there. Great force, but it also has its limitations and it leaves certain people behind. Charity and the nonprofit sector, again, great force for good, incredibly great intentions, but um, really missing systems change and really changing things systematically for the long term. Last year, I think, in the United States, we uh, gave away about $317 billion in charitable giving, and yet poverty peaked uh, at dramatic records going as high as going back to the time of the Depression, where the, the gap between the rich and the poor has been so dramatic. So 
some people are doing really great within capitalism, and some people have kind of leveled off, and that number going back to the 1960s is flat. And so, so poverty uh, is at its highest level in the past year, did you say? Poverty is... Uh, is that in the U.S. or, or worldwide? Poverty is uh, at a high related to the, probably to the, great, the, the recent recession, so it's not the highest it's ever been in the United States. The gap between the rich and the poor in the United States is at an all-time high going back to the Depression. Okay. So, uh, and you generally see poverty follow the line of employment and unemployment. So there's no big surprises there. But while the wealthy are coming out of this last recession pretty effectively, gaining back what they lost, we're still seeing a lag in poverty. And that also means that the nonprofit sector has not been uh, has not recovered either. So we're seeing this real gap. So the question is, how do you bring what's good about capitalism to social change? And how do you bring the motivations uh, about helping the poor and resolving poverty to capitalism, and they both need each other, I think. And so that's really where the idea for social enterprise that I've been involved with for now the last 20 years has come from. What has happened in the field is that we've all had pieces of it. We've had businesses doing a little social good, but a lot of PR, not so much real change. We've had nonprofits with great narratives, but usually aren't sustainable. They're really depending on someone's donation, someone's gift. They're here today, gone tomorrow. And if you talk to a leader of a nonprofit, they'll say, I'm always in begging mode. I'm always trying to find someone to make me sustainable. So we don't really have a sustainable social change sector, and we don't really have capitalism, I think, being harnessed for the good that it could do for everybody. And that's, that was the idea. So Michigan, of course, for all of our states, the reason I was interested, I, I live in Washington, I was interested in Michigan because of Detroit, Flint, uh, the poverty rates and the crime rates and the challenge there, and the uh, state itself was very open to new ideas, and that really impressed me that they would be open to the idea of social entrepreneurship. When we first talked to them, the state government, many were saying, is that like Twitter, is that Facebook, is that, so no, I said, that's social media. So they didn't really even understand what social entrepreneurship was, but they were open to new ways of tackling social problems. And I think everybody would agree that the old ways have not dramatically succeeded in any great way. So they were open to giving it a shot. And the shot that we gave it was, let's create a contest where we find organic grassroots social change solutions from people who are living in that reality. Great ideas, in my experience, tend to come from the grassroots up, rarely a cookie cutter from Washington down. So how do you identify those innovators who have lived the experience? The idea was have a contest, identify those innovators, but then do something else. Educate everybody in the process. So rather than create winners and losers, we created an education process where we did webinar webinars on social innovation, how to be an entrepreneur, how to create a business plan. So you're training the social entrepreneurs and how to be successful social entrepreneurs. Exactly. We, this, we expected the state, was, when we first talked, they were saying, be ready for 50 to 100 people to really be interested in this. We had well over 600 people interested in the model. And uh, by the time that we actually had business plans submitted, we had 200 business plans submitted. Uh, and we chose uh, 12 winners. And uh, the great part was we didn't just stop there. We took the winners and said what's really miss missing in the social sector was investment, true sustainability. So for four months, we invested in in-depth coaching, training to make them investment ready. And then just recently, after four months, just recently, we had a group of investors come to Detroit, meet with the winners. They pitched again, but at the time it was an ask for an investment. And I'm excited to say, as of today, four of the ten are under a due diligence process to study for potential long-term large investment to bring them to scale, to, to bring their models to transform the world. Uh, other states are now interested in this model, and I really believe this is a way of bringing the forces of a really smart capitalism to a really uh, passionate and compassionate social sector. And I think that could be the future of capitalism, the future of business as we know it. Well, I know that uh, speaking to younger folks who are getting into the workforce and young entrepreneurs, that um, the younger generation really seems to take it as a given that, of course, how I go about doing work and what I do for a living will make the world a better place. And they're all sort of 
naturally looking for that junction of purpose and profit, while uh, folks in the older generation are much more struggling to catch up ideologically, uh, because we were raised in a world in which those are two very different things. Right over here, we have the process of making profit, which is really a morally neutral activity, or in some cases, morally negative. And then over here, we have the process of doing good, and that's done by nonprofits and churches and NGOs and stuff like that. And if I'm a good business, I take some of the money from my selling of goods that people may or may not need, like free cereals or whatever, and then I put it over here and give it towards a cause, and that and that makes me now morally positive. Uh, but, th but this is something different. This is where the act of changing the world is a revenue generating process. Did I get that right? You you summed up really well. Um, quite recently, I spoke to uh, David Rubenstein, who's one of the founders of the whole equity funding movement, and so he's a huge philanthropist and uh, obviously a very successful businessman, maybe one of the top in the country. And I said, "What do you think about this idea of social enterprise?" And he said, "Completely opposed. You should make your money in business because that's a certain motivation. You should go with that energy in business." And then when you make money, you should then give it away to socially charitable entities. Um, so you really nailed it. He described that. When I do work with younger people, millennials. He's really articulating that split that the older generation exactly. has. That these are two exactly. completely distinct worlds. Exactly. And the distinction is so profound that I speak to the investment community, the investor community. They are very skeptical of anything real taking place in the charitable sector. As they would say to me, look, I put my money trust to avoid being Uncle Sam. I gave it away. I don't really care that much where it goes because it's lost money. And I think they tell good things, and I hope they do good things. I don't. I hope for the best, but I don't really think it's doing much. And, and I've spoken to some of these people who um, are frustrated after years of giving large sums of money to charity at how little that actually produces in the way of real change and transformation in society. That is. That is the sad truth of the social sector, which I've sort of dedicated my life to. We are a sector with great narratives. We can tell great stories. We can have a kid stand up at a dinner and say their life was changed because they didn't do X, Y, or Z thanks to this nonprofit. We aren't business changers as a sector. And so um, I think the investment community asking that question is a fair question to ask and dig deeper. The side is when I work with the social sector, they are distrustful for the most part of capitalism and business. Um, going as, so far as to say capitalism is evil and saying that business is evil and that they've seen the figures, they're motivated by greed, the 1%, and so forth. So these two worlds um, have, in many ways, grown in opposition to each other. So to bring them together, bring these energies toward change is uh, exciting to me and it is amazing that the younger generation, I work on the board of something called Compass Sparkers, which is a college led effort to be entrepreneurs. They're refusing to fit into these labels, yeah. and they are telling me, uh, "Rich, um, I make a lot of money, and I want to do good, and I'm not going to choose between the two of those, and I want it to be consistent, and I want to balance it." Um, I just judged a contest recently. I said to one of the young men, "Ever think of creating a nonprofit?" He sort of looked at me puzzled. He said, "In my lifetime, I've never seen a nonprofit really succeed." <laughs> He's 21. <laughs> You know, in his lifetime, that's not a choice. He doesn't want to, you know, that's about power. Why would I do that? <laughs> but in his life, he's also seen the, the, the mythology and the story and the whole startup industry. And so they really love that energy, but they're not interested in just creating another widget. Um, they want to do something social for social. So it's an exciting moment, a new moment. And these contests are ways of kind of bringing the two worlds together and translating across these two languages of the investment world and of the social sector. I, I having a logical background for sort of this passion to truth or truth to compassion. You need both of them. One without the other is not a very effective way of solving it. Now it, it, let's say for a moment that some university, you know, per, you know, a head of a, a business school or something like that, or, or, or a, a, a state senator or a governor or somebody like that happens to be listening. So what's the benefit in Michigan? Any other municipality that chooses to hold one of these contests and and uh, you know and, and advance these efforts and fund these people and of course the funding is coming from investors, not the state, right? But, but if I'm if I'm that politician or that head of a university who's, who would 
consider sponsoring such a thing, what, what would I gain from doing it? How does this help the vote happen? Right. That's a great question. I think it's different depending on which audience, but if you're a politician, your career will be judged largely on what you do to change the employment numbers. To be quite frank, that's probably the highest correlation. So this is a way of tackling social issues. And remember, every one of these social entrepreneurs become, is a small business. So if there are four, five, six people, that's six new jobs. Then if they actually transform, most of the successful social entrepreneurs transform someone's life from not working to working. So that's a huge challenge for a politician. If you can just move one person from, say, wealth to work, it's a transfer of cost to the state. So they're very interested as politicians. Also as politicians, this is this uh, movement brings together the best ideologies of both. So it's really transpartisan. And that's uh, interesting politicians as well. In the, in the culture right now, they're looking for solutions that in them votes, not uh, so they can do uh, votes instead of going to a real harsh ideological stance on one side or the other. This is truly not ideological. So that's very cool for a politician. In Europe, what we're doing right now, you're a pioneer in a new field that uh, could be the future of, of business in America. And political leader launching that. For the act leader, what I'm finding is they are getting huge demand from their students, as we were talking about, saying, I want a social entrepreneur back. And what? So they are now desperately moving to catch up to this demand from young people. And so this is a great way to brand your school way. They'll track students. The part of this is it's something you do just on campus. It's bringing the community. And one of the big surprises in Michigan was the aid and their graphic for our winners. We expected a sort of a millennial crowd would be interested in this topic under 30. The majority of our winners were 40. Um, with and many from the minority community. So that broke all the traditional uh, entrepreneurial content demography. So um, that's a great way for a university to build communications with town and gown. You can reach out to your local community and bring in more community leaders. With these, uh, now these, these uh, universities also, I imagine that the students want training in this. They're not interested in an academic theoretical program. And that they, they're, they're wanting to learn how to do it, right? Yes, there's a phone ringing right now. Yes, it's not my phone. It's someone calling for you. <laughs> I thought I turned it off. Sorry, yeah. I had it turned off. I apologize. Uh, so, we're 15 minutes in here. I don't know if I can edit this or not. Oh, I'm sorry. I think you could edit. Uh, I, I may be able to. Let's see. Okay. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, we'll see if we can do it. All right. So, your question was about so what's something with students. So, uh, so students in the, in this academic setting now they're going to want training in how to be a successful social entrepreneur. They don't want they're not looking for a theoretical academic program that teaches them the economic macroeconomic business, right? I mean, they they want to be business leaders of tomorrow. Exactly. Um, students, you, you can explain this in theory in about. 15 minutes, and what they're not really being taught is how to be an entrepreneur. And being an entrepreneur, even not a social entrepreneur, but just being an entrepreneur, is going to be a skill set that's crucial for the new economy to going into. The old days that you check your uh, life at General Motors and spend your whole career there is gone. You're going to be an entrepreneur for your career. They want those skills. Universities have been very slow in teaching how to manage your life as an entrepreneur. So just that course. The other thing is, by bringing in successful social entrepreneurs, Young people can see what it takes to really change the world, and it gives a concrete belief in how it's going to happen. What we're finding is it's probably not going to be a college student who has the most incredible social entrepreneur ideas, though that's what people think. It's probably someone who's been in the field for many years trying to serve the poor and help um, the other. Or, as I recall from some of the winners in your one, some of the poor themselves who have now lifted themselves up out of it and are trying to do likewise for others. Exactly. If you were doing a Silicon Valley startup, I would ask you as the founder, what is your background that makes you uniquely expert in this topic? Well, if you've grown up on welfare, that actually makes you an expert. If you've been homeless, if you have been a veteran, uh, it makes you an expert. In a way, things that in the business world people might look askance at as a break in your background, 
I think these are huge uh, proof that you're more likely to know how to change that system than anybody who's at a think tank or a university or, um, God forbid, a government program trying to figure out that solution. It's a, that purpose training program that we all undergo. <laughs> so, um, one of the things I thought was really powerful about what you did there, and I think you also uh, published this uh, through Stanford, um, was your definition of a social entrepreneur. I thought that was great training for people to, because it really challenged them to think about how they were going to change the world and how they were going to make that a profitable venture. Could you? I don't remember the exact details of it. Could you go over the model with us? Yes. Uh, the background is that the definitions for what a social entrepreneur are just so academic right now that, quite frankly, uh, I think I'm pretty well read. I often don't understand the language in the definition. The challenge we're facing in Michigan was how do you explain this very quickly and understandably to a population that's never heard it before, and it's not an academic discussion. So we boiled it down to five key points. And the first is really that the social entrepreneur is a visionary who has a track record of success and is pragmatic. We we're looking for that. So one of the first things you have to show is, I can do this. And as you have probably heard, many investors will often say, don't show me your model. Show me your bio, because I'll invest in a person with a bad model. But if you're a person who can't get it done, if your model's great, it won't happen. So we really uh, use this uh, first check point, this personality, as our first test in our grading and our evaluation. Also, uh, as we've talked about, the second point is it addresses a clear social problem. So what problem are you seeking to solve? So you've got to be super clear about that. The other one, uh, the third point, was that it changes systems. That's probably the most radical of all the five points that we came up with. We weren't looking for symptom changers. We were looking for systems changers. So if your idea was, there's a bad homeless problem, I'm going to increase the number of beds for homelessness, double it so we'll have more beds for more homelessness, and every year we'll increase more beds, that would be a symptom solution. It would be compassionate in the short run. To be the need, but it doesn't solve it's necessary. But it's not Absolutely. But it's not Absolutely. changing the conditions that created the problem in the first place. Exactly. And so we're really looking at we were really looking at systems changes. And if I have one critique about the whole social sector, it's been too symptoms oriented, and I'm I'm pushing in the direction of symptoms. So, so that the is what it always comes to my mind is shipping food to a place where the people have had a bad harvest and now they're starving. So even if I can find a model that is profitable to ship food to starving folks, it's still not social entrepreneurship by your definition because I'm not changing the conditions that caused the famine in the first place. I'm treating the symptom, which is hunger. Is that right? Pretty close, and I would say in that particular case, if you could prove that every year you'll be able to deliver the food to those people forever and that's not going to be an issue, then you could argue that's sustainable in my experience. And and that's the other, uh, the other two. The other two, really quickly, is um, that the number four, the model would have to prioritize social impact over economic income for the uh, model. So that just means that there's a lot of great businesses that do good. When they're faced with a choice, I can do more social good or I can make a bigger profit, they choose a bigger profit. So that, to me, would not be a social entrepreneur. That's just a really good, good business that serves so it's an a good entrepreneur business. with a social marketing message, basically. Right. And this fifth point uh, is the model generates the sustainable income stream. So I'm very blunt about it. And that would be uh, the worst part of social change around the world that the United States particularly has engaged in our models is none of these are true. We're, not, we're only dealing with symptoms. We're not sustainable. One year we're funding this program, the next year we're not. Often we come into areas well intended and we take away part of the local economy with the solution. And then uh, three years later, we're not interested in that topic anymore, but we've wiped out that whole field. Um, I've seen this happen with uh, mosquito nets, condoms, um, and even things like Tom's shoes, which is considered the best model of a social entrepreneur. For every shoe you buy, he gives shoes away. You're actually potentially wiping out shoemakers in that local community. Now, he's heard that feedback, and now he's moving to the point of creating a training for local folks to produce shoes. That's a, so that's a, that would be the difference. Sustainable enterprise. As as I'm shipping the shoes, I'm treating symptoms. Now, uh, and back to the fourth point there, this is an interesting. Well, remind me what the fourth one was? Uh, it would, you would prioritize social impact over financial gain. Good. So, a question about that. So, if I'm a, a CEO of a big business, uh, particularly a publicly traded one, um, I may fear, and potentially <laughs> legitimately, 
that uh, I'm going to be the subject of a class action lawsuit under Sarbanes-Oxley because I prioritize social benefit over financial gain for my shareholders. What would you say to that? Well, I'd say two things. One, um, the, uh, we are creating new legal structures that are going to avoid that. Um, there's 12 states that have something called an L3C, which is like a limited liability corporation. You don't have to show a profit. B corporations are also moving in that direction. But I would also say to that uh, CEO, you might want to redefine what stakeholder means and what shareholder means and, and, and talk about a broader view and communicate that with your stakeholders and your shareholders. I know that some are very clearly legal entities and they will ask you to show what you're doing. But truthfully, businesses in this country have had a very narrow view of what is success to them. And very often it's at the expense of people being poor or people being obese or people smoking or doing all kinds of behaviors. Like that externalized costs now where the way I transact business produces profit for me and a social cost for somebody else. Exactly, exactly. And the truth is, what I think we're beginning to understand is that someone else is us. Right. So <laughs> I can only externalize it so far. <laughs> exactly. That we are what we're learning in the world in general is the illusion of our being disconnected is an illusion that we are connected. So now I have a different energy when I talk to business about education. In the past they would say that's the government's job and it's a local school system's job. Now it's holy crap, I don't have enough people to work in my business in twenty 20, 12, 20. So I'm, what am I going to do in the, in the next 10 years? What are we, we don't have a plan. So suddenly they want to get involved with education, um, health care. The work I'm doing in Mexico is because corporations are realizing that wellness and prevention has dramatic impacts for business. Or in the old days, we run a reactive model. So I think that would be one approach to it. The other is you're probably not a social entrepreneur as a business. You're an entrepreneur or you're a corporation. What I would suggest to you, and we're including in our model, be social innovations, socially entrepreneurial. For example, the people who do your laundry for your tablecloths could be ex cons who find it extremely hard to break into the system. How about bringing women who have been trapped on welfare and haven't found a way in? to create a, a, a program, to bring them into your business to do something, anything that you can do to help people move into the job market is life transforming for those folks. And it might take more work from your business, but that would be a way you could do a piece that would be real, as opposed to a lot of corporate social responsibility, which is more PR and it's sort of the crumbs off the tape that are left over for the poor. 1% of whatever of our baby fur seal sales. <laughs> so yeah, and we actually every year we buy our Christmas tree from Delancey Street, which is a group of uh, recovering alcoholics, folks like that, people really coming up from right out of the gutter, you know, and they're, they're the ones putting out the Christmas trees and selling Christmas trees. So. Well, you're, you're, you're tapping into what could be one of the most important trends in this arena, and that is that in the future, I think we're going to look at your social responsibility index, what you're doing for, uh, in a social responsible has a competitive advantage. Then in the future we're going to ask, why doesn't your, this company has these employees, what are you doing that's socially responsible? And if you don't have it, I'm not going to buy it from you. So when I'm talking to business, I don't just say, look, you need to move in this direction because I want you to have a bleeding heart for social good. I, I argue with them in pure business terms. This is going to be a competitive disadvantage for your company. Very few now, I can almost name them, have said to me, I don't care. I just don't care. It's very few. Well, I remember Ray Anderson, when he got into the whole sustainable carpet thing, specifically in response to an RFP, where someone was saying, okay, you want to bid on this carpet deal? Tell us about your carbon footprint and your plan for you know, environmental impact. They didn't have one. And that was what actually caused him to get into the whole thing in the first place. And then he became a huge leader in the field. But that was a result of a buyer who wasn't willing to buy carpet from someone who didn't have a environmental sustainability story to tell. Yes. And the first place they're experiencing that in big businesses right now is something you mentioned earlier. And that is their young employees are saying, 
I might work with you, but what are you doing that's socially responsible? What's so, your organization's higher purpose? How are you changing the world? What's your mission? Exactly. All purpose questions. And so companies are scrambling to put together brochures that are tying together a good. They're now telling the story. And it's only a story, unfortunately. It's not. Well, that, that's the, no. the employee branding. I, I love that term. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's, it's really literally that. It's marketing to their own employees about what a great place to work. Exactly. And as talent becomes uh, more competitive, they're now fighting for the smartest and best people. And those people are demanding these these certain values, and the values are very different than they were even 15 years ago in the workplace. So now, a lot of the folks who are listening here are uh, change agents who are not yet making a living, or are barely making a living at their Change the World efforts. They're solopreneurs, they have little tiny companies, usually service-based businesses, stuff like that. So let's talk about this issue of scale and fundability, right? So, because uh, there's all these people who have you know purpose in their minds and love in their hearts and they really want to do good and they're not able to make the money or get the investments or stuff like that. What what did you what have you learned from all of the years of experience, but especially from this contest, about the issue of fundability and what it takes from us as aspiring social entrepreneurs to become successful social entrepreneurs? That's a great question. I would say two things. On your personal life, on your personal side, on the interior journey of yourself, you need to get clear on your true true purpose, your deepest purpose. So if you don't know that, then you will be chasing after everything that comes down the pike, and everything will sort of sound good, and you'll feel a little bit like you're still leading expert on that in the country, and I would encourage people to read your book and engage with you on that on the personal side. On the business side, uh, speaking as someone who's come from the world of, you know, theological school where I never did a business plan, uh, I think that those of us on the social side of the social sector are magical thinkers about money very often. So we resent money, we don't like business. We don't like Excel spreadsheets. We don't like five-year projections. And if I'm living on purpose, then the money should be sitting in a pile outside my door. That's the magical thinking. We kind of believe, I'll say it for myself, because I have a religious background, but it goes something like this. God, I'm going to follow you, and I'll live any life you want me to live, and I'll go anywhere, I'll do this thing, I'll, I'll just be a giver. I'll be a giver. And uh, But implicit in that negotiation is you better deliver the cash to pay the bills. The anger among particularly religious so, if you're, I hasn't. So there's a narrative of a victimization. The world doesn't care about doing good, and that's why I'm not doing good. What social entrepreneurs can learn from the financial folks, and I, I really do include myself in all these learnings, is put together a financial plan, and even if you're not looking for investment, put together an investment pitch. What would you pitch from your company to an investor? What return could you get them? And what you'll find is if you do it, one, it's very empowering because it forces the money argument. Two, you might be investable. And for a social entrepreneur looking to scale, that was the question you were asking, how do you scale? You probably do need investment. You probably can't bootstrap this to change the world. So you're gonna to have to attract capital outside of yourself and create a win-win scenario where the person who invests in you might get 25% back on the investment after five or six years, and you have launched a social change model that has gone uh, national, if not global, and changed the world and had huge social impact. But it requires that dollars and cents argument, and bringing these two worlds together is a very powerful way to do it. Yeah, when I uh, presented at the Global Summit in London uh, a year and a half ago, um, there was a whole group of guys there from the uh, socially responsible investing uh, sector. They were the ones who were running the funds. And their complaint to us, everybody else's the thing, was you guys aren't serious and you're not really presenting yourselves in a serious manner. Like, you're, you're not making it easy for us to invest in you. You're making it very, very hard. Um, and and there's sort of like this sense of entitlement. Because I'm trying to change the world and trying to do good, 
I therefore deserve the investment money, whether I have my financial calculations worked out or not, and whether I can reasonably tell a story about how it will produce a profit or benefit for the person who's investing or not. Um, and that was a very interesting wake-up call for me and many of the other people there to see, wow, okay, we're, we're actually asking for something unreasonable when we want people to invest in us and we don't have our investment map done. Exactly, and it goes both ways. So I, I do it both sides. Now my pitch to the investment community is, folks, we are doing something really new here. And this isn't a straight-up investment. This is a social impact investment. So you're going to have to operate with a lot more compassion and understanding and mentorship and teaching to my social entrepreneurs. You can't just cross your arms and close down because they don't have a business model that works because that is completely new to that sector. So please go in with compassion. So I find myself constantly translating between the two sectors. It's kind of this sort of like, show me you're not worthy kind of. Yes, and uh, believe me, I've heard both. I've heard both sides. Uh, I led a panel with me in Michigan on social impact investing, and members in the audience who are from the social sector started lecturing the investors and saying, "You need to come to my community. You need to." One person said, "You need to crawl across the broken glass of my community before you really understand what we need." And my response was, "I've been chasing money my whole life. In some ways, I don't know really wealthy investors who want to crawl across glass to give you money." You better make this really easy for them. So both sides have a, a little bit of a game going on here. And so to the investors, I'm always saying, I'm not arguing with you. What are you going to do to create the old flop? What small investment are you going to do in that person that gets them the small amount to write a business plan, to have due diligence done, to help them get an account, to help them get their, and it could be very small amounts of money, but create milestones along the way. It's too simple for the financial side to cross their arms and say, social enterprise isn't where I want them to be. I'm not going to give them money. And, and this is really what you've done personally in your organization and in these contests, which is to help bridge this gap through training of people on both sides and to create venues where they can come together and learn about what, what each other are doing. And also, I, my, my, my experience of the investors, and I know uh, some of the people who are involved in this, uh, is that they actually would really like to give them money. They need. They almost need to be given the, the finances as a justification. <laughs> right? So it's like, please, please, just give me a reasonable case. I want to give you the money, but I can't just flush it down the toilet. You have to give me something in the way of a of, of a business case and a business plan. So, uh, so I so I love this. So then you're training the social entrepreneurs, coaching them, helping them understand what they need to have in place to be invested. And then coaching the investors to help them understand how this is and how it's different, perhaps, than what they're used to. Do I have that right? You really do. And what we have right now is we have two really good stories going on. We have social impact investors saying, we're doing this really cool thing. We're giving to social entrepreneurs. And they're not giving that much. And they're usually doing it in a charitable way without any real plan. And so that sector is a good narrative. But they, they haven't delivered and then we have the social sector that says, I've got this great entrepreneurial thing that's going to solve education in America, and, da, 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 da. and they're getting awards, they're being in Forbes magazine, they're getting all kinds of accolades, but they're not transforming education. So we have these two sides telling great stories. We have to get beyond the stories and make this real. Cool. Um, any other advice you'd want to give to an aspiring social entrepreneur about what they need to do? So I heard very clearly, get your purpose straight. Understand what your change the world methodology and your mission are, so you're not distracted by shiny objects. And make yourself investment ready by having a business plan and your finances straight, which is showing this is how the process of changing the world is going to generate revenue, and this is what return you, investor, can expect as a result. Uh, those are the, the two I really heard. Anything else you want to add to that? And I think you have to do a gut check because being an entrepreneur of any kind, but particularly a social entrepreneur, is more difficult than an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur can say, I'm going to sell this game on this app and make a lot of money. That's a pretty straightforward conversation, direct cash, and these people are my customers and they've got money. Social entrepreneur is playing chess at three levels. Very unlikely that you'll find that the person you're helping can be a customer. So you're, you're involving very complex ways of looking at the world. Uh, I think more exciting, but you need to do a gut check. 
you really have to ask yourself, am I ready to ride this roller coaster? Because it'll be a roller coaster. There'll be days that nobody believes in you. There'll be days where your funding will be up or down. So you just need to kind of fasten your seatbelt and say, do I have the tolerance and the discipline to manage myself in that situation? I would, I, but I would come back to getting clear on purpose, knowing why and who you are, what you're doing, to get that inner, inner debate solved. That's the biggest challenge. And then you can get help on, uh, from, from anybody really in the financial industry, on how to create a, a, a budget that are, argues for an investment. Even if you don't go for investment, that will change your mentality about your own business. Now, I, this is a little bit off topic, but I, the truth is I really just can't control myself, <laughs> which is that you're also involved in transforming government. And uh, yes. you know, we're, we're talking here about the, the intersection of the social change movement, nonprofits and NGOs with business, but there's another part of this triad here, which is government and its role in the whole thing. Um, now, I know you've published papers on this, and you're working on programs for this to, to reform, to upgrade our sort of democracy software, if you will. Um, can you just say a little bit about that? Because uh, the kind of people who are interested in social entrepreneurship are usually interested in that, too. Yeah, it's not even that much different, Tim. It's a great question. I really go almost call them um, social political entrepreneurs. That's what we really need to change the paradigm of our political system. Um, we're more in our daily life engaged in business, and we understand business and social entrepreneur and business and, and entrepreneurism. It, those things are clear to us. Politics for most of us is a game that somebody else plays that we comment on the sidelines. We don't have that much. We have a lot of opinions, but not much skin in the game as we think. Um, we're mostly just, just gruntled fans throwing rotten fruit from the stands. Exactly. Um, I hear this about every day, but uh, just a recent interview on 60 Minutes with, uh, with the, uh, one of the top leaders of the CIA said the greatest threat to America right now is our broken political system as a security threat. He felt that was the number one threat. It's not terrorism from the outside. It's the what we've been witnessing in our government, and it's kind of breaking down right so now. Our capacity so, to destroy our own way of life by having a dysfunctional government for long enough that we become, in effect, a failed state of sorts. Exactly, and I do believe that the United States plays a very important role in the world, so there are really ripple implications when you start screwing with um, American government and our role in the world. So it, it really has big implications. All the things that I care about, social change, ending poverty, helping the poor, making capitalism more effective for all, all those things will be stymied by a broken political system. So that's really what's driven me. I've become an accidental political activist in my life in a funny way. And, and uh, I actually think that if I could pick on a, a hierarchy of strategies, politics, probably even business, because it's going to have an umbrella uh, impact on, uh, on business and on poverty. When we fail to regulate, prepare for what became the recession of 2008, like I said, the rich have come back. They were horrified by what happened to their investments. The poor have not. So whenever we screw up in government, the people at the very bottom are always the ones who hurt the most. This government shut down again. It was a game for a lot of people. It was a kabuki dance. But the real people at the lowest level suffer when that game is played. So I'm very interested in transforming the political systems. I think in the same way we need to move to a more collaborative model of politics. And I'm actually learning from the social entrepreneur our efforts in um, Michigan and around the country to do something along the same lines. Um, for politics to unearth innovations from the grassroots level of Americans that can envision a new paradigm of politics. And so I am working on exactly that model as well, because I think that's the even bigger issue. That's great. I would love to have a whole interview devoted to that, and we'll do that one of these days. Um, I'd love to. Excellent. Any, any other parting words you want to offer to our audience here about new paradigm of government, the new paradigm of business, social entrepreneurship, um, anything about it? Just you're at the right place at the right time, even though um, people don't quite get it now. It is the future. You mentioned earlier on that I spoke about gay marriage and debated it with religious uh, right leaders going back to the mid-90s when the issue polled about 15%. And in those interviews, I said, "This is you're on the wrong side of history. This is going to move in this direction. And everybody thought it was a little crazy. I think that's how we're looking at social enterprise right now. The people who are on this call, I'm sure people kind of like poke at them and say, you know, that's not business, or that's not really nonprofit. Here, that's not very real. But I would say to them, they're at the right place, at the right time. 
and we have to make the story true. Right now it's good narratives on both sides. We have to make it real. And so everybody who's involved with what you're doing, Tim, in the transformation of business is really making the story real. We don't need any more pat your back stories. We need to make don't anything get real. And I think that's what we're doing. So this is a very exciting moment to be on this issue. And I applaud people who are signing up for your um, your webinars. I've watched a number of your uh, YouTube episodes that you've done, and I would encourage people to watch those as well. I think the way you're thinking is crucially important to this. One thing you've helped me with is I thought I was a paradigm shifter, but you've even sharpened my skills about thinking how paradigm shifts, and I know you delve into that in some of the YouTube episodes. I would encourage people to review those. because We have to encourage each other to realize we are keeping ahead of the game. It's about to change, and from a business perspective, that's a very smart place to be. And let's say a business leader is listening who would really like to have his company taken more in this direction, or someone who's a head of a nonprofit and would like to make it more systemic, someone who's, who really wants to transform an existing system. Um, how would they get in touch with you? What would you recommend? It, the easiest would just be email on that, rich at thesquare.com. Um, they can Google Rich Chapel too. It's, uh, it's pretty easy to find me. I'm very available. Uh, I'm on Twitter. And uh, they can say hi to me on Skype, all with Rich Chapel. <laughs> so I would say reach out to me through all those various uh, channels. And uh, if I don't have the answers very often, I don't have all these answers, but I do know who does. Okay. And I can put them in, in charge, I can put them in touch with the person that can be there to the city. So it was rich at the public square dot com that got cut That's right. a little bit. I'm sorry, yeah, rich at the, the public square dot com. Rich at the public square dot com. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rich, and I look forward to speaking to you again in other venues, and I uh, hope people take advantage of all this great information you put out and uh, go out and change the world profitably. Thanks so much. I would like to thank you for having Okay, well, as you saw, we had a few technical issues there. Some we knew we were going to have, and others are, are new. <laughs> uh, these things always happen differently live than they do in... Uh, in testing, so apologies for that. So, Rich, uh, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself there so we can answer questions live. We have a couple questions that come through. Um, one is um, a tech question, which is, will audio of this interview be made available in a downloadable MP3? Uh, I'm going to say yes. I think that's a great idea to make audio of this available. And um, so go ahead if you haven't entered questions yet. I see there's a few people who've typed in, but in that chat window, if you have questions for me or Rich, go ahead and start typing them in. Uh, so I'll come back to these questions that are in there later. But for now, Rich, um, uh, we talked uh, yesterday, I guess it was, that since we recorded this interview, some of these things have moved forward, that there's been change even since then. Can you talk a little bit to that? Uh, yeah, just uh, briefly, uh, in Michigan, we've... Uh, had eight out of the ten winners from the competition come under investment since we, we, we've talked. And, and, the, and the commitments are uh, already over a million dollars. So we are beginning to see for real that uh, when we prep social entrepreneurs for capital, they can actually get it. And uh, there are people interested. So uh, that has that's new. And the other thing that's new is that um, we kicked off a social entrepreneur competition in Orange County, California, and that one is open to anyone in anywhere, whereas Michigan kicks off their second one today, and that's only limited to Michigan. So what we will do for this event is we'll put a link to that website for any of anybody listening. They could enter that contest and uh, hopefully get connected some investors with their winning idea. Oh, that's, that's awesome. And we actually had a question about that, um, about how do we get in touch with investors interested in social enterprise. I know that there are funds that specialize in uh, socially conscious investing, but often they're looking at much larger, more established things. So if they wanted to get in touch with investors, one way to do it would be to enter the Orange County contest, if I understand correctly, and, w and we can provide folks uh, uh, access to that. Uh, so I have that right? You do. Uh, there's also, they could check out a website, which we could also list at the end of this, uh, the Global Impact Investor Network uh, that goes by the name Jen, And it is a network of um, investors who have banded together with some foundations, all wanting to invest in social impact. 
Cool. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> anything new in the other area that we talked about in uh, the transformation of government? Anything you want to report there? Uh, nothing really dramatic, though. I think the work that we're doing in the social entrepreneur field is laying the groundwork for some very good models for how we might transform the political network. Uh, what, if you think about it, if we could create a competition for political social entrepreneurs with creative ways to transform American democracy and then have those ideas invested in, that could be a very smart way for us to transform our broken democracy right now. So we're looking at using that as a possible template on the political front as well. Excellent. <clears throat> I look forward to, uh, to diving more into that with you at a later date when there's more. Sure, I'd love that. Good. Uh, so Christiana asked an interesting question about the different legal structures, and I think we just sort of kind of glossed that a little bit in the interview. I think we can go into that a little more detailed here. So, so if I'm a social entrepreneur, so uh, and you know neither you, you nor I are lawyers, so we can't really give legal legal advice. But from our understanding of what are the different structures, and I think also it varies by state. But let's say I'm a social entrepreneur. Let's go over the menu of choices that I have available to me uh, in choosing what type of legal structure to use in order to house my venture, okay? So, uh, so first of all, they're the classical ones, right? So I can be a solopreneur, I mean, I mean, I can be a sole proprietor, just do it under my own name, or a partnership, I can have a partner and do it as a partnership, in which case I don't get any liability protect protection. I can do it as a 501c3 nonprofit. I can do it as a C corp or an S corp, right? So any of the classic business models are still available to me—a professional corporation, if I'm a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. All of that stuff still applies. I'm just now doing it as a social entrepreneurship venture. Is that correct? That's correct. I guess uh, what my advice—that question always comes up. My my advice is to think of it really in two camps: for profit or not for profit. Traditionally, social entrepreneurs have been nonprofits, and in fact, many of the foundations that have been the champions of social entrepreneurship, uh, for example, the Skoll Foundation, would only uh, accept a nonprofit as a, a winner of their Skoll Award. So, I think the first question for someone deciding what category to get into is: it are you going to be a nonprofit or a for-profit? If you're going to be, um, what's I, the most interesting direction this is all moving is the winners in Michigan, uh, I would say all of them that were nonprofits eventually moved into a for-profit uh, uh, organization that was connected with your organization. The reason is really this. If you're a for-profit, you can have investors, you can get equity in your company, and um, that's a very big difference. If you're a nonprofit, you can uh, you can take on uh, loans and you can get that sort of investment, or you can just get grants. But you really can't get investment, nor can you count your work that you do uh, as uh, equity, and you can't give out equity in the organization. So um, it seems to me, if I were advising people today, I'd say please do look at the for-profit structure for organizing a social entrepreneur. Then, Tim, as you said, once you get below that, and you can talk to a lawyer, you can check these out. There are all the for-profit entities that you just mentioned. What's new is that there's something called an L3C in uh, 12 states. Um, California has created its own sort of version of that as a, as, as a different state. And there's something called a B Corp, which is just really, um, it's an organization giving its blessing on you. It's not a legal status. These other statuses that I'm talking about are not federally recognized yet. So the groups that, for example, in Michigan, there is an L3C, and the difference is you don't have to um, you don't have to show that you're necessarily um, purely out for profit, and you are more eligible to get money from foundations who traditionally, as 501c3s, cannot give to for-profit organizations. They can under this. So a lot of groups use it in some ways as marketing, and they're trying to pioneer the new way. So new uh, IRS statutes are coming to life to meet this this intersection taking place. If I were going to advise in most cases, I would say uh, LLC is a great way. Uh, gives you the most flexibility and protection if you're going to do it in a for-profit manner. I hope that's not too detailed. <laughs> that's good. And, and I, think, I think I heard that some states are implementing B Corp 
as a business entity type. But in general, I think you're right that there's the, there's an organization that basically certifies you as a B Corp. Exactly. It's really a certification rather right. than legal entity type. In most cases, it's possible that some states have. They're practiced. seeking to make that law. Yeah, they're seeking. They want to make that a legal um, uh, status. So they're they're uh, lobbying at local and federal level to make that a legal status. And, and the other one uh, I'm aware of is that. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yes, and that is that a lot of states are passing laws, and this is to counteract the limiting belief that a company can only advantage its owners, its shareholders. Uh, and there are many states passing laws saying that it's legal and permissible for an organization to consider the interests of other stakeholder groups besides the shareholders, such as employees, the community, the environment, um, stuff like that. And, and that, and that's legal and permissible behavior to basically what we would call play win-win and collaborate between the stakeholder groups rather than how some people interpret the law, which is not actually accurate, but some people interpret the law to say that you have to do what's in the shareholder's best interest even if it means screwing everybody else. And so they're basically saying, no, that's not true. Right. We're on the cutting edge of some new uh, corporate uh, created categories. Good. Now we had another question here from a gentleman who says that there are, uh, I think it's a gentleman, um, says that there are a number of different levels of social entrepreneurship behavior, not all of which would meet the standard of your five uh, criteria. And I do, I do have to say that those five criteria set the bar pretty high, right? So if I'm running a soup kitchen, by your definition, I am not doing social entrepreneurship. And, and that may run counter to some people's notions of what that means. I, 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 what I like about your definition is I think setting the bar high makes it more likely that change will occur if people are following that definition. But he's asking, like, if you're a really small business, you know, maybe systems change is setting the bar too high when you're getting started. What's some step-by-step -step stuff you can do from the outset that would work? Great question. So... The, the, one of the checkpoints is systems change, not symptoms change. And the reason I'm sort of, I'm pretty adamant about that area and I stick with it is we've spent too much, too long in the living belief that we can't change the system. So we can only do our little part. And therefore, poverty has stayed at the same level for the last 50 years in the United States because we say it has to stay at that level. So we can't change that. When we say you have to show how you're changing the system, we begin to look at the ecosystem of everything that's impacting uh, impacting it, and I just f fell across a great quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that I had not heard before where he said, uh, and I'm just paraphrasing, but he said, uh, fighting poverty is not throwing a coin to a beggar. It, it is not superficial. It is looking at the system that created the beggar. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's how we have to start thinking. Otherwise, we're going to perpetuate uh, just putting Band-Aids on problems and not finding out what caused them. Now, in the case, let's say the soup kitchen um, or whatever, they could absolutely be systems changers. One great way to be a systems changer is to change public policy. So, for example, I work with a program called College Summit, helped low-income students get into college. That's great, and they did it school by school, but the systems change they did was they actually changed the Higher Education Act of America to require schools to measure the number of kids going to college. We as a country did not know that uh, answer until that was put into law. Once that was regulated and that number was required, all of a sudden schools started working on getting their kids into college because they were measured for it. So that's an example of taking an issue and making uh, public policy is a great way to move towards systems. It's very daunting for many people, so they don't want to do it. Another thing but is... Just a question on that on that example, Rich, before you move on. Sure. Which is, sound, if, if I understand correctly, you were requiring that schools measure what percentage of their students went on to college, but you were not attaching funds to that or making it punitive or anything like that. It was purely that the number had to be measured and that the number had to be a matter of public record and nothing more. Is that correct? That was originally how it started. Now, then, when the um, under the Obama administration on Race to the Top, they actually put in uh, financial rewards for schools that move that number. So it starts bit by bit, but now I would say in almost every uh, federal uh, measurement the, for a school, you're going to have to show that. And that came from interviewing principals of schools, of low-performing schools, who said, 
frankly, I'm being measured in a lot of things, and college access is not one of them. So I'm I can't focus on it. Um, so so you can do systems change. I think policy is a, a great way to do it, and I think we need to do more to change the political system um, for change. The other thing is, unlike in the traditional entrepreneur world or business world, where I say to you, "Tell me your competition and how you're going to beat them." That's a win lose way of thinking. In the social entrepreneur world, I would ask you, "Tell me who else is out there doing it and how you will partner with them." How are you going to work with government? How are you going to work with Democrats? How are you going to work with Republicans? How are you going to engage schools? How are you going to engage uh, the local community? In other words, partnerships are systems, and then you can so systems change that way. So when a um, social entrepreneur is launching and they say, "How can I show any systems change?" I would ask them, "Show me your partnerships. Show me your knowledge of the field that you're working with others." It's a very different way of looking at business as opposed to um, how you'll destroy your competition. Great, and and then back to this this question: if if I'm running a small service-based business, right, I'm probably not going to be looking at changing policy, uh, and I'm not going to be partnering with political parties and stuff like that. What type of systems change is available to me uh, from that? I, I think I have an example in mind, but go, go ahead. What would you say about yeah, that? Yeah, probably a case that it would help me be more specific, but I think what I would get at is I would ask the question, um, if I'm running a homeless shelter, why are the homeless people coming in? What can I do to stop people coming in? Would it be providing them with homes instead of with cots, for example? Uh, I worked at a homeless program here in Washington, D.C. We helped people um, get driver's license uh, who were homeless so that they could exist in the system. However, to exist in the system, the system required that you have a address and a check, which homeless people generally don't have. So that was a break, and that kept those folks from ever going into the workforce. So rather than just sort of giving them a check and saying, here, we'll get you through this, we actually changed the law in the, in the District of Columbia, uh, the, the local church did this in uh, D.C., and they changed the law so that if you could show that you were at a homeless shelter, you could get the pass. It's, that, that would be a systems change rather than asking the person to go through, you know, write a check and have them constantly go through these, these broken mazes. So the system changes can be quite modest. The, the issue is that it's treating a, a cause, not treating a symptom, and it could be treating that cause on any scale. An example, while you were talking, an example I remembered was a client of mine um, in Iowa who wanted to, this was after doing some purpose work, he decided he wanted to impact um, literacy and performance and education among poor children. Right. And rather than going after the schools and doing that, what he did was he went around to a bunch of local restaurants and he got them uh, them and various other businesses to donate like a half price dinner or you know different stuff like that. And then he used these as prizes and what would happen is they went around to all the, the poor folks. What they discovered was, by the way, the reason he, he the solution he was going after was they discovered that they know that if parents read to their children, their literacy goes up and their overall school performance goes up dramatically. And what they found was that the people uh, the, in poverty were not reading to their children, no doubt, because they had many worries and things on their mind. It wasn't, it wasn't a priority for them. So what they did was they set up a reward system where these uh, various different businesses would donate this stuff, and if they, could read, if they would read to their kids for a month, then they'd get a reward. And if they'd read to their kids for another month, then they'd get a reward. And then they'd go out to dinner at these restaurants and do all this other kind of stuff. This program took off. It took off. He's not even really involved in it anymore. Everybody loves it. It's great advertising for the businesses. The kids love it. The parents love it. And now it's just growing like wildfire, and it's like got a life of its own. And he's like only peripherally <laughs> involved. It's a great example of very, very, very small scale, simple addressing of the underlying problem, not the symptom. Exactly. He what he did was he asked what caused this as opposed to, this is how it presents. And that's that's what a systems changes. Good. And it looks like we have one more here, someone from Australia. Oh, they're saying they're fi having a more benign situation in Australia. <laughs> that's how nice for them. Um, let's see. Uh, so entrepreneurship in general is less pronounced in Australia. Um, how do we bridge the gap if we're dealing with a culture, as many cultures are? So here in the U.S., there's a lot of 
um, awareness and press and a sort of valuing of entrepreneurship as a behavior. And for some countries, that, that whole point of view, and we do have viewers from all over the world here, um, from, from an, or a culture where that's not a high value, how do we bridge this gap? How do we make this conversation relevant to them? Um, let me see if I understand your question. Are you saying in cultures that don't value entrepreneurship? Yes, where, where that's not the main topic of conversation here. That's a very high and present way of, of looking at the issue. So we're talking about blending social and entrepreneurship, right? Well, if entrepreneurship isn't a really high, high, high value, how, how do you we communicate this topic in well, such a setting? The, the, um, what we're doing really is we're translating across sectors and we're building bridges. The secret is to start with this, with whatever with whatever side you're starting with. Begin there. So if you're in a culture that is uh, more of a welfare state culture, let's say, and it doesn't value entrepreneurship, but it, it values probably more the social welfare culture, you could go from the social side and say, how do we make these social programs sustainable? And that would be a way to move it forward because they might be afraid of the words entrepreneurship, and they could be afraid of business or free market or capitalism. So you could go in that direction. Um, it's interesting uh, going around the United States even, frankly. Um, I talk to some audiences and they're very afraid of the whole idea of the free market or capitalism or business or entrepreneurship. Um, more liberal areas in the United States. Now recently I'm in this contest in Orange County, California where they really get the entrepreneurship. That's where Entrepreneur Magazine is. So they really get that. The social thing is kind of new to them. So I think you start with where the person is and you talk about do you see a way to bridge it? And I've been amazed at the ability of this issue, of everything I've ever worked on, to really build bridges uh, across for people. And everybody feels like it's a win. Yeah, that makes sense. So if we're dealing with more of a Republican free market type audience, then we stress the uh, entrepreneurship aspect of it and the, the, the free market forces being used for social good. So we start there. That's home, right? Now, if we're dealing with an organization that's more socially oriented or, or a culture that's more socially oriented, we start and say, okay, so look at how we're going about solving these things. Well, two issues. One is we're treating symptoms, not causes. And two is the way we're going about doing it isn't sustainable because we just have to keep dumping more money into it. Wouldn't it be great if there were a way that this could be self-sustaining? And so now we're not using any scary, you know, free market language with them, but we're basically saying the same thing. Good. Exactly. I like it. And the, social and the social sector itself, the people doing the work, they're exhausted because they want sustainability. They're doing so much work and getting so little pay that they're looking for new ways to operate. They're very open. Excellent. Good. Well, we've answered all the questions that have come through, and we're a few minutes over on time. Apologize again for the uh, technical glitches. And Rich, thank you so much for making the time. And thank you also for the awesome work you're doing. I know you're doing work in, in government. You're doing work in religion. You're doing work in social entrepreneurship. You're doing work with business. You're doing work in other countries. Um, you're really a, really a global change agent, a man after my own heart. So thanks for joining us, and thanks for the work that you do. Thank you. I have a great coach, Tim. Thank you. All right. We'll sign off here. And folks, in uh, about a month, oh, I wish I had the date in front of me, we're going to have another interview. You'll get some emails about that. Uh, we've got a wonderful lineup of really, really powerful uh, thought leaders and business leaders coming forward. This is just the first of many, and uh, we wanted Rich to start things off right. So thank you to Rich.